My name is Gareth. I'm a games user researcher at Playtest Cloud. At Playtest Cloud, we're a remote user testing platform for mobile games. In this session, I'm going to talk about the Games User Researchers Toolkit, tools that we as people doing research and UX work in games can use to do our jobs, and how those tools are changing. Let's look at some background and context first. Now, I've called this talk a Games User Researchers Toolkit, but I'm an ex-charity sector researcher. So my first instinct was to start thinking about what kind of better awful metaphor I should be trying to shoehorn in here. So we've got your toolkits, that one, and really this is what I'm going to stick to, because I'm going to talk a lot about tools. But I also thought of things like mosaics and patchworks, things where you use diverse pieces to build a bigger thing. And then I thought of Pick and Mix, that venerable British institution where you go to the shop, fill your own bag with sweets and all the different boxes, which I think COVID pretty much finished off. And then I started to think about stacks, so, you know, development stacks, technologies that underpin um, uh, products and the work that we do. Because this is something I'll, I'll come to the when we get to the end of the talk. And I do want to start by talking about tools in the wider UX world, the non-games UX world. And I want this to be mostly platform and brand agnostic as far as the talk goes. But it's a talk about testing tools, and I can't avoid talking about the UX research tools map because a lot of the services and platforms on here will be familiar to you. You know, there's video testing platforms, recruitment tools, all the ways to, to conduct surveys and do design. The main reason I'm showing it is to hammer home that the UX tool ecosystem is fairly well developed. It covers the whole process and it's broad. So there's lots of choice available. And something that's important as a regular non-games UX researcher is in leveraging the, the range of tools available out there. Like week, week one in a non-games UX job is a laundry list of signing up to the tools that the team uses to do its day-to-day -day work. And for that reason, you often see tools or like types of tools, families of tools, listed as requirements in job specs. And employers might prefer, in a 50-50 situation, a candidate who's got experience with the tools they use. Even outside of games, I think there's a relationship between using tools and UX maturity, but it's, it's not simple. I think the best way to describe it is as a push and pull effect. If you've got adequate tools for the job and you're using those tools well, and you're using them to do better and more efficient research, you're probably pulling yourself up through the middle ranges of those UX scales, those maturity scales. Because it's likely that you're using those tools consistently and you're trying to get data that helps you develop the product. But at the same time, it's pulling you along. Using these tools well can be a really good way to strengthen all the principles of maturity, but it's complicated. And when we go on to talk about the impact and implications of using tools on a day-to-day -day basis, we'll start thinking about how to keep a methodological mindset, even when it feels like, you know, you're just focusing on what tools to use. That's non-games UX. In games, it's not so much like that. In general, that situation I've described with non-games UX isn't there in games. Without going into too much of the why, just look at the range of services. For playtesting and researching games, there is not the breadth of choice available in terms of platforms and services. And some methodologies just aren't as easy to do as others. But I think even having that patchy coverage is new. It's quite recent that you can cover most of the process and achieve most of your, your research goals. Which leads me to the next point. In talking about tools, I wanna to be clear that outsourcing playtest function is nothing new. There are agencies, services, and even individual people out there who can support outsourcing. If you want to outsource, you're usually doing it for one of two reasons, either to address your high-level research goals and questions or to solve capacity issues. I think the high-level goal-driven one is like, we need to test this new feature. We've got to test the first-time user experience. And we want to assign some money to getting answers to those questions because we don't have the infrastructure or expertise or either in how to do it ourselves. Capacity driven is more like, we've got internal resources, but they're bottlenecked. Either they're busy on other projects or they're having their time eaten up by day-to-day -day activities and duties and admin and data collection, the actual things that constitute, you know, play testing. In both cases, you can choose to outsource parts of the research process or the whole thing from end to end. Usually making that choice is based on two things. What do I want to plug in and what deliverables do I want back? What am I what am I putting into that black box and what has to come out? And the second question is, what's my budget? It's more expensive to outsource more of the process. 
Summarizing up to this stage then, tool coverage and integration in regular UX is, is fairly widespread. It's not so much like that in games, but it's creeping along. And then COVID. Of course, COVID meant teams transitioning to full-time remote working, collaboration using uh, services and tools, and the big one, in-person playtesting almost entirely off the table. That didn't just mean closing big labs. It meant closing many of the informal avenues to play a feedback that studios might be relying on. You know, no trade shows, no nothing like that. So even anecdotally, we were seeing a shift. And to me, it looked like an accelerated uptake of that model that's already there in regular UX, where services were much more integrated with the day-to-day -day of games UX research. And that is not easy. That's a hard thing. Like accelerated change, especially if it's brought on by external factors like COVID, can be incredibly challenging for organizations and the people working for them. And it comes with risks and problems. So our position was, we want to understand more about what was going on. And as a tools provider, we felt like we were in a good position to do that. We did some work with the audiences that we had access to who were our users. Like we piggybacked onto a customer service survey find, to find out how users were using remote testing services during the pandemic. And then we sort of drew that into our ongoing research program as a theme, like support needs, what's missing from the support out there and what are the wider impacts? We do lots of regular like customer service and customer support and feedback sessions. Some of that's formal user research as well. And all of that combined for, for me alone over a year, that's like a number of sessions getting into the triple figures. But let me highlight one big caveat there that you are thinking it's a very limited and biased sample. These are people who are already engaged with remote playtesting. So I'll do my best to refrain from generalizing too much and interpreting them to wider groups. What I'm going to do is focus on the implications of that accelerated switch. And like broadly, this is going to be about benefits and risks. Benefits are the easy wins, the things that the people I talked to were positive about in terms of this shift. But the risks are the things they were concerned about, and I'll talk about those things in terms of how they could be avoided. Right. First, a perceived benefit of adopting tools and services is that they provide structure and consistency for teams and researchers to do their day-to-day -day work. To dig down into that, tools and services are seen as providing a solid structure, like a vehicle in which to learn about research and UX research and develop processes. They encourage consistency, help you choose methodologies and stick to them for whatever your goal is. And they can be really helpful in presenting the outcomes and data in an efficient and useful way. So they help with analysis too. It's not just about getting the data done. They help with interpreting and analyzing data. I also think they can be helpful in getting teams to develop solid set ways of addressing certain types of research goal. Like we're running a concept test. Let's use this template on platform A, or we're running a longitudinal test. Let's use our boilerplate setup on platform B or C. But here is also a point to evaluate your tools as well. Do they encourage and support users toward good practices? Like not just you, but your team as well, and others in your team who might not have the same UX background as you. Will it help those internal conversations about UX and research methods and the player experience if it doesn't find one that does it better? A perceived risk is that tools and services could provide unhelpful structure. I mean, this is the evil twin of the previous slide. Uh, the structure of the tool might lead to users consistently misinterpreting findings or interpreting uncertain data with too much confidence, too much certainty, or just, you know, doing research that doesn't help the product. And an even worse potential outcome is that these issues become embedded in the way that you or your team work. And generally, when I've seen this happen before, I put it down to a bad fit between users and tools. What do I mean by a bad fit? Usually that the deliverable it provides isn't what users were expecting. How do you ensure a good fit? On the studio and researcher side, it's a question of properly interrogating the tools. How do they work? What do they do? Do we understand what they're doing in the background, in the back end? Can I try them out? Are there places I can go to find out how the systems work? Can I talk to the developers? Can I talk to the vendors? Can I talk to the business team? Are there support materials or communities that I can talk to other users? 
I think in general, the most healthy way to incorporate tools into day-to-day UX work is probably to encourage other people to think of them as tools. And that sounds obvious, as tools with specific uses. They're a part of the research process, but they are not the whole process itself. That's led by people. Because it helps us think of tools as infrastructure. And this is where we go next. Another perceived benefit is that tools and services can be part of your research infrastructure. For studios, tools become the infrastructure for your user research team. Having access to the right tools for the job, using them in a way that is consistent and supports mature UX and design, it's one of the ways that you can actually have an infrastructure. It's an alternative to building all of the processes of research end-to-end yourself, from recruitment to data collection to legal to incentives to all of it. What are the best ways to do this well? One thing to do is test the water. Using free trials, using freelancers, using consultants to run uh, test projects. But another is to have people who have experience with the tools. Hire people who have specific experience in the survey and testing tools that you use or similar tools. I mean, you want to be flexible here and balance this against other qualities that people have when you hire them. But you're also looking to cut down on training needed here as well. For researchers, this is a bit different if you don't have control over which tools to buy in and subscribe to. I think my advice would be focus on research craft, the bits of your day-to-day work that are unique to your training and your judgment and like your, your creativity, the bits that cannot be aut- automated. More time doing research craft means not only more time to do the bits of the job that you love doing, but also expanded capacity. And this is one way to frame it when you're talking to the people who who actually hold the purse strings. The other side for researchers is personal development and skill sets. I do not think every researcher needs to know every tool intimately. But as we said earlier, employers like the candidates who have experience with the tools they use. So having some knowledge and experience of the tools that an employer uses might be an advantage when you're going for a role. You know, ask what they use take advantage of free trials and try them out. But really, like, look at how they fit with the research methodologies that you use every day when you're trying them out. The likelihood is you know all of the theory and basics that underpin how they work already. Like when we're hiring for you know business development and project manager roles, we don't necessarily need someone who uses the exact same tools that we do. But we would really struggle with somebody who doesn't use any modern tools at all Maybe they only do mock-ups on paper and they keep their contacts in a Rolodex because we want to see that they can pick up and use these tools and use them effectively. Another perceived benefit of adopting tools is in providing extra capacity. For example, when internal research teams or team members are swamped, as a UR team, you don't want to turn down work, but capacity is limited, constant crunch is terrible, and you've got a limited budget. And yes, this is this is true. But I think it's more the case when you're considering end-to-end outsourcing. So like that goal-driven type we talked about earlier, where you want to plug in goals and get out answers. From a tools perspective, I actually class this as a risk. While you might have all the tools you need to run just a couple of extra studies, have you got somebody with the expertise and know-how to do this properly and use the tools well, and in a way that gives you results in a format that is useful to you and your team? If you want to do this, my advice is, budget for somebody to manage the project from end to end. That could be a consultant or a freelancer who you've worked with before and feels comfortable managing the project or someone internal with the same skills and knowledge. I think a longer term uh, and more sustainable use case here is in providing some amount of elasticity. Having tools in your toolkit that you know well and can pull out as and when they're needed, which does give you extra capacity in busy periods. From a studio perspective, You also need to have a research team who who feels comfortable doing this. But I think the best model is that you don't just rely on tools at certain times. Instead, you rely on them consistently, not just in busy periods. And you reduce the time needed to run like standard boilerplate studies and offer more diverse research methodologies to the teams that you work with. The idea being that it's not just teams coming to you when the build is stable, when the game is ready to be tested. That's That's a recipe for bottlenecks waiting for stable builds. Instead, you're offering concept testing, discovery, scoping, testing UI prototypes, and you don't get this rush to test every aspect of the game 
when the stable build is available. And you've still got elasticity then. During busy times, you point people to the ready-made options and at lower times to the more bespoke. Another risk I've heard more from researchers is that using, could it be that using tools and services results in biased research strategies? Does it encourage studios to put off testing until they have a stable build? Meaning they don't start testing until late in the development cycle. And even before I, I go into that, something else. It's the same thing happening when we talk about bang for your buck. And this test isn't actually about tools or, or even remote and moderated testing. I feel like I'm guilty of this. I recommend certain types of tests as the way of getting maximum value and impact. I think the danger is that that advice sticks too well and studios don't go on to test using a range of methodologies. They stick with the usability test of the first time user experience with five users. And they do that once the build is stable and that's all they do. And we've spent time thinking about this because I think it's something to to be approached as the tool landscape expands. And I think it's, it's really key because it's moving the conversation onto using tools and infrastructure well. There's a list of principles here that's a combination of things we've seen studios doing effectively and things we've recommended doing to avoid bias strategies. First thing is don't put research methods in the drawer, even if they don't work first time or something seismic like COVID happens to the testing landscape. Don't write methodologies off. The other next thing is test across the design life cycle. And if you've got to go into DIY methods to, to test earlier in the life cycle, go DIY for it. But also try taking a DIY approach when you're using platforms and tools. Hack them, innovate with them, do new things. Do things that the vendors didn't expect you to do when they designed it. Collaborate with others on what works well and what doesn't. Because I think this is maybe an opportunity. It might be easier for smaller, newer, more nimble teams. If you're not tied to existing methodologies, look at what you can achieve and innovate with these tools and try it. Like, let's think about the example of stable builds. Even if you're using remote and moderated testing, you shouldn't wait until you have a stable build. But you do need some creativity on how to guide players and be accepting of errors when they do happen. You might have players using debug menus and navigating crashes and things. Give the players the info they need to do those things. And even if your guidance doesn't work the first time you try it, iterate. It's the thing we say, right? Encourage early iterative testing. If it takes a couple of iterations to get the guidance and the research process right, then maybe it's worth it to be able to do this kind of testing. And all of this is new. This use of platforms is all new and it's all ripe for doing innovative, like uh, new types of work here. We talked about research craft earlier. This is the place to do it. Use them in new and different ways. And finally, don't be afraid to interact with vendors. They can advise, they can give examples of how the product's been used well and in innovative ways. Because the people who created them know lots about how to get things done and how to achieve the goals that you want to achieve. And to finish up here, almost, what's your stack? We talk about the, the technologies, the, the encoding and, and like development. In those areas, it's super useful for new hires and for doing recruiting. And it's fascinating for people who work in that space because it reveals the underlying processes of like these big developers, these big companies. It's not a secret what Uber uses. It's not a secret what like big developers use because you can see it in public. It's all out there. So maybe for user researchers, we can say, share your stack, talk about it, and you might learn more from others. Find ways to share and like test out the processes of others and then iterate it on it for your own purposes. And when you see other people doing it, raise them up, like retweet them, give them more publicity. Cause I love it when I see it. Um, I'm gonna try and share mine on, on Discord after this session. Uh, so others are free, uh, can feel free to do the same. And I want to end by returning one more time to the UX tools roadmap because we've pulled out all of the categories of UX research tasks that are covered by the roadmap. This is not a game specific tools map, but there are tools and services, however, in these groups that are completely appropriate for using in games UX. All the ones I've bolded here, there's loads of tools that you can use here. And when I talk to our clients, they are using them, not just us, they're using all of these services. Even just a few of these could be a way of saving you a lot of time. And if you're doing clever things with them in, in combo, please do share and collaborate how. Thank you for listening today and please do enjoy the other talks. Thank you.